Wally, I think we're rolling now, and if we're not, we should be, because yeah. I want to say, you essentially came from a flying family. Flying was in your blood from the beginning, wasn't it? In this museum, we have a, an old JN4 at Curtis Jenny. Mother and dad barnstormed after World War I in a Jenny. Dad convinced mother to get out in the wing, act like a wing walker. She just got out on the wing. But her great story was she stopped wing walking when I was in the hangar. <laughs> <laughs> and so as time went on, you eventually wound up in the Navy. Where else? Well, in fact, Dad wanted me to go to the Army at West Point. We lived near there in northern New Jersey. And I saw a naval aviator come into town with greens and a brown pair of pants and a gold set of wings, this kind of gold. I said, I think I want one. I'll, I'll do that. So I went to the Naval Academy and studied West Point. And from the Naval Academy, it was Pensacola and then combat and a little bit of everything, wasn't it? Had a taste of just about everything. Uh, Somehow or another, though, you wound up being an astronaut. How did that happen? That is probably a scary recollection, but I can recall going to Washington, looking at three men on a stage, two engineers and a shrink. We learned to say shrink. I think it was really a psychologist. In fact, I saw him as Bob Vos. <laughs> I just saw him recently. Here you can call him anything you <laughs> no. like. No, Bob knows that. I've called him a shrink his whole life. These three men tried to convince me how neat it would be to get in a rocket or in a capsule on top of a rocket. I said, no way. I'm an aviator. I'm a hotshot flyboy. I'm a, I'm a test pilot. So, so I'm a test pilot. Now, the result of that is that I really want to get out of there. Then they said, well, don't worry. We're going to put monkeys and chimps in there first. I really want to get out of there. We, were, we didn't even volunteer. We were ordered to Washington. And that was the time to say no. I went back to Patuxent, where I was testing aircraft, talked to my peer group, and they said, look, Shira, if you want to go higher, farther, and faster, this is the one way to do it. OK, I'll, I'll go along for a while. Did you ever regret that decision? A number of times I have regretted that, because I missed my Navy very much. I was trained to be a commanding officer. And NASA never understood what a commanding officer was. This was sort of a, a group of people with equal rank. And there were times when I asserted myself as a commanding officer, particularly in Apollo. And I, I, I recall one of my greatest presentations was from John Healy, the manager of the spacecraft, who got me this big annunciator for a ship, uh, all ahead full. <laughs> it said, from your crew, go ahead full, Shira. And I, that's one of my favorite possessions. <laughs> I'll get back to that, as a matter of fact. I'd like to very mm -hmm. much. Uh, but right now, let's go back in time. And here you are. Now you are an astronaut. Early on in the train. <laughs> now I are one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was a big surprise. Uh, seven of us sitting on a stage in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of press corps. You don't, you don't know what those people are, I know, but they were there interrogating us, and we all had these dumb answers, except for Herschel. John had a good answer, John Glenn, of course, had a good answer for almost anything, and right away we said, gee, this guy has some ideas we don't know about. <laughs> and we began to realize we were becoming public features or public, public individuals. It was something we were not prepared for at all. You learned in time. You it even took us up being it, a television star in your own right. Well, oddly enough, what happened? We we were drawn into this slowly but surely. I, I, I guess my favorite memory, though, was Bong. <laughs> See, I'll come back to my favorite memory. My favorite memory, though, really, was going after that press conference from that press conference to the Hill, and watching senators and representatives make absolute idiots of themselves in front of all these news people. We all look at why are they doing this? And we visited with the, the Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson. And then I knew what a mogul was, what a power this man was. He had an office that looked like a Hollywood set. And here we are looking around, somewhat awestricken ourselves. And our local representative or senator would came in and salam practically. I said, my gosh, we've joined a whole new world. We haven't done a damn thing yet. And so it was. However, once you got into Mercury, you started doing some honest engineering. So let's start with that, if we can. Let's, let's hmm. engineer the Mercury spacecraft uh, as you lived it. Well, when, you, when we joined the Space Task Group at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, we all sat in this one big office, large steel desk, which is the greatest th threat to mankind as an officer to get a large steel desk. You hope for a mahogany desk, not one of these big metal slabs. We sat there saying, what are we going to do now? We've got to make this thing flyable. We're all test pilots. So we all picked various areas of concern that we felt we could individually do the best with. I got in the environmental control system, the suit system. Uh, I think Deke was on the controls, the flight controls. We all unanimously had one vote every time. We wanted a window in front of us, a window we could look through. 
The initial version had a little tiny round window down by your right knee and a little tiny round window up by your left shoulder. And they looked like what I would call chick sail when the little half moons when you try to look through them. You couldn't see a darn thing. That's what Shepard had to fly because we couldn't change the windows in time. That early in the program, did you have any real objective in mind or were you just going to fly in space? We, we felt we would put man in the loop. We wanted to replace the chimpanzee. We wanted to prove we could fly the vehicle, do something that man had never done before, of course. We wanted to be sure we could do it well. We knew the tools we needed. We needed this window so we could make observations out that window to align the spacecraft with the horizon, with the star patterns, with the geographic patterns. We had to make a hand controller with this right hand. We had to make it pitch, roll, and yaw. Had no room for rudder pedals. So we had a whole new flight control system with our hands rotating back and forth. This is a pretty difficult task. How would you describe the engineering in the Mercury system? Good, bad, and different. How would you describe it? I, I was amazed because uh, Mr. Golden, the present administrator of NASA, said something about risky devices. I thought that was a very well-made machine and very, very carefully designed. I took great umbrage with his saying that. I told him that, by the way, personally. So it's not something necessarily that could be cut out of the film. He didn't know that we had gone so, so far with every engineer, with every detail, to get that spacecraft exactly the way we wanted, including the booster here in San Diego. We came out and visited General Dynamics, who made Atlas. I'll never forget Gus Grissom saying, do good work. <laughs> Very poor grammar, but it got the message in. And we, were, we touched every facet of that vehicle. Went to McDonnell in St. Louis, long before it was McDonnell, Douglas, or now Boeing, or whatever they are. The uh, result of it was we got to know Mr. Mack. We got to know the engineers, Walter Burke, John Yardley. It's just like brothers. And we worked with these men around the clock, visiting, living in St. Louis. And that, that kind of thing really made Mercury go. We knew what the spacecraft was like, every component of it. But the only thing we didn't know about was that escape hatch that I hit with my hand one time. <laughs> Did you really know it that well, though? I'm remembering back during that era, and I used to see atlases go up and come back down in mm -hmm. flames more times than one. What we found, we man-rated the atlas we flew. And they grounded, in fact, uh, after John's and Scott's flight, the military atlas, so they would have enough courage to send me up on my mission. <laughs> it was flat grounded. I go off on the mission, everything works beautifully. Uh, the, the spacecraft reacted the way I wanted it to. The interesting part was, though, I got back from the flight, visiting Hangar S, where I prepared for my suiting up and getting into the spacecraft. On top of Hangar S was a ladder. Went up the ladder, they told me there was a launch of an atlas. It lifted off about 100 feet and maroon blew right there. Very consoling. <laughs> This was before or after? After, right after the flight. Right after your flight. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean when I said, did they really know that atlas as it had been converted to man rated? Did they really know? We, we talked about reliability in terms of nines, meaning that if you had a nine times a nine, now you have reliability of 0.81 because you multiply the two reliabilities together to get the ultimate. We had about a 0.9 on atlas, which is pretty high. What is very interesting, the four surviving of the original seven astronauts all flew Atlas. Of course, you flew Atlas, Gemini, and the Saturn. Too. Yeah. You flew them all. But, but everybody's worried about the Atlas being dangerous, and the, the surviving four, the only ones who ever, only astronauts who ever flew an Atlas, are still alive today. Carpenter, interesting, interesting point. Cooper, Sharon, Glenn. Of course, too, since your job at that time was to find out what's man going to do in space. Mm life support became rather important, and that was one of your areas of expertise, was it not? It really was. Uh, the life support system had to be designed just right, and I can recall John Glenn had a hot suit circuit, Scott Carpenter had a hot suit circuit. I had one for one orbit, but I knew what to do. There's a little water control valve, little teeny tiny valve, actually it's the right hand, and you turn the valve very slowly to get water to drip through this plumbing, through a heat exchanger which made the water boil, at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it vented into the atmosphere or space itself. That was a heat exchanger. If you, vented, if you ran it too fast, it'd freeze. If you ran it too slow, you'd get hot. So I was sneaking up in the right setting. By the end of the first orbit, I said, I'm fine, let's go. <laughs> and then too, you were working on the Mercury suit. Oh, that was a beauty, wasn't it? That suit was unreal. If you imagine spending a million dollars for a suit with only one pair of pants. <laughs> 
But the real key was to get the suit to fit very tightly. If it's loose at the, at the elbow, for example, when you move your arm, you can't move it. It's, it fills up that void, so it fits you very well. A change in weight of five to six pounds was enough to make the suit a bad fit. Then from Mercury, you also worked in the Gemini suit. Yes, I did. What was the well. difference between those? Oh, uh, we had a little less junk inside the suit. We had thick protection. We weren't sure how well the suit would work in Mercury. It had a sponge layer, a thick uh, silver layer on the outside. We finally got the white uh, Nomex material that wouldn't burn. Uh, even though that was something that came along later in Apollo, but we were worried about flammability of materials always. And the suit was a much better suit. Why? It had to be we were going to do a spacewalk, which we could not do in Mercury. So it had to be a good fit. We still had to have what we call a tactile touch. The suit gloves had to fit very carefully, almost like racing car driving gloves. And that was kind of interesting. Then we put little lights on the back of the hand so you could see what you were doing. You know, a good way to describe all this might be to just take your Mercury mission and relive it. Hmm. Could we do that? Gee, before my time. <laughs> 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 well, I, I think probably the, the best part of my Mercury mission was naming it Sigma-7, meaning a sum of engineering effort, not a fancy name like Freedom or Faith or Aurora, not that I didn't appreciate those names, but I wanted to prove that there was a team of people working together to make this vehicle go. That's why I talk so wildly about knowing the engineers, how they were brothers and buddies, and all of them were. And that, that's what I saw as the ultimate on that mission, was a, an engineering test flight, where we weren't gonna look around for fireflies, we weren't gonna look for the lights of Perth, we weren't gonna give prayers to the peasants below. We were gonna make this thing work like a vehicle. And I, I never gave those messages when I flew a Mach 2 fighter. I flew the damn thing until I got done. And I wanted the, the the Mercury flight the same way. So when we got into orbit, the boost phase was quite simple. Although I found out later it rolled faster than it's supposed to have, but it did stop at the right time. But once we got into orbit, I realized I could take control of it because I said, I do not want this to be an automatic control. What happened on John's flight and Scott's flight, as soon as they got into orbit, they separated and shoo, turned it around rapidly to get in the retro attitude so they could mission control could then have reassurance that they could bring it home. I'm not up there flying for mission control. I'm flying for old Watashi. So I separated and went off automatic and went Pts! and waited about five minutes and finally came around to the right attitude, which was looking the heat shield first. I'm looking aft, I'm looking back toward where the booster was, but I never got to see it. It was so much time between the time I turned around and when the booster settled down out of orbit that I couldn't see it. You were conserving fuel, among other things. That. that was the whole idea, to conserve fuel. Uh, uh, not, not to criticize John and Scott, but the mission was designed to have a chimpanzee in there. They replaced the chimp. But that meant they had to have a lot of automatic maneuvers. Automatic maneuvers took a tremendous amount of attitude control fuel. And I said, I don't want to do that. I just want to save that. And as a result, I ended up, I think, uh, about retrofire, about 80% of my attitude fuel was still remaining. Which is, stay up for a full duration mission. Yours was rather an open-ended mission. It was. I could have gone on and on. Uh, thank God I didn't, because Gordon Cooper he used all my talent and had to use every bit of his own <laughs> to endure that long. But the uh, the interesting part of it was, I'll never forget this part either. Gordo and I were trying to figure out how we could look at the world from orbit. We had no simulators that could do it that do it that for us or do that for us. So we took an echo balloon, a hundred feet in diameter and painted on it the geographic points that we would pass over on an orbit 32 north, 32 south, adding a little bit so we could see on, out to the horizon. And we took a cherry picker and hoisted ourselves up a little tiny vehicle with a window like we had asked for and looked at the globe at tangent as if we would be in orbit. The technique worked perfectly. I think that airplane is yeah. more than we can handle. Yeah. <laughs> That bird really yeah. passed by yeah. directly overhead. So we looked at this large echo balloon with the earth painted on it and practiced our retrofire maneuvers so we could do the little teeny tss, tss, that kind of stuff instead of tss, tss. I got back from the flight and I said, Gordo, I had a real problem. Our earth had no clouds on it. You gotta put clouds on there. <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm prompted to note as a footnote that the spacecraft behind you is your Sigma 7. Notice the name on there, yes. Mm -hmm. That is Sigma-7. 
it's in remarkably good shape. Oh, no, that's a copy of it. This is a copy. Real Sigma 7s at the Hall of Fame in Florida. Okay. Uh, but they have a better version of Sigma 7 painted here. Someone, by the way, on my Sigma 7, which is in the Hall of Fame, our Astronaut Hall of Fame in Florida, the panel where Sigma 7 was painted on is missing. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to chase that down with either Don Engen, the Smithsonian, or something. But that, that somebody must have lifted that. Somebody swiped your back. Yeah. Maybe Max Airy has it, not just in <laughs> Kansas. You had a specific goal in mind, I'm sure, when you were flying your mission. You mentioned it, but let's vector in on it. I, well, I, I saw Scott Carpenter got involved with playing with fireflies, which was that same water I talked about in the, in the environmental control system that cooled you. And it came out as NH2O, one molecule of water, which froze instantaneously into one snowflake, but a very tiny, tiny snowflake. These stuck on the outside of the spacecraft. They drifted around. This is what John called fireflies. This is what Scott got involved with, banging the spacecraft and watching them come off. And as a result, both of them lost sight of the fact they had to have fuel left to fly the mission. Uh, John got a little wrapped up. I did too, because I was his Capcom in California on the retro rocket package that had to be kept on because of a false signal that said his heat shield had detached when in fact it turned out it had not. But anyway, that became kind of a traumatic part of John's mission. But in both cases, they ran, almost ran out of attitude control fuel. And that kind of shook me up because I said, there's no reason to do that. So I, I went to great lengths to drift. In fact, I, <laughs> I alienated some of the flight controls because after drifting for a while, I put it back into automatic control. I'm in chip mode now. <laughs> which didn't go over too well. <laughs> you also were navigating the spacecraft. You were using the stars. You had spent a lot of time. Let's talk about that a little bit. Where did you get this knowledge of the planet oh. formations and what planets to look for? How there's, did that all go? There's, there's some state on the East Coast that has a planetarium, North Carolina. <laughs> Couldn't resist doing that. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> we, uh, I got you. We were taken to... Uh, Planetarium at Chapel Hill. Moorhead. Moorhead Planetarium. And Tony Genzano was our instructor. Tony is long gone now. Tony taught us every trick in the trade about how to recognize stars, how to put the constellation together, how to get checkpoints so we could find out what stars we needed to know very well. And we became quite proficient at that. Uh, Bill Douglas, who we lost just recently, also went to the planetarium with us. He enjoyed that. But Tony would put us up on little chairs, much like a spacecraft, with our window again and then he put projections of little constellations and things up there for us to look at at night in the planetarium. So as a result, we learned the, the, what we call the celestial field, the celestial pattern, which took us through Apollo, really. And it's kind of fun, because uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, because when we got to Apollo, I had been assigned the role with Walt Cunningham and Don Isley backing up Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee, and Ed White. We arrived at Griffith, planetarium after they had been training out there, having been working with Tony back in Moorhead again, even for Apollo now. And this, this is worth getting right. <laughs> Take it back. Matter of fact, there comes another jet. That's yeah, that's, this one goes on by. Yeah. The director of the Griffith Park planetarium, the same as Tony Genzano of Moorhead, told my crew, Cunningham and Isaac and myself, that uh, we have three stars in the celestial system now that we didn't know about that uh, the Apollo 1 crew told us about uh, that they learned from Tony Genzano. They're Navi, Denosis, and Rigor. <laughs> Navi is Ivan Grissom, spelled backwards. Rigor is Roger, <laughs> spelled backwards. And Denosis is Ed White II, spelled backwards. And this poor director of the planetarium for at least two years thought those were real stars. <laughs> Uh, did you actually use the stars for navigation? We used them for reference for yaw. At night, if you couldn't see the Earth clearly, because it, it's dark just like it is when you're down on the surface, uh, you don't get good checkpoints. But the star field is right there. You can say, oh, that planet is where it should be. That star is where it should be. That's my yaw attitude. Very, very precise. We're talking about oh, thousands of a degree. The same, same use of the stars was used in Apollo to one Ten thousandths of a degree. That's how accurate that stuff is. Did that celestial navigation, I think I could call it that safely, did that ever help a crew anywhere along the line in terms of flying and navigating the spacecraft? I think Gordo had, had the perfect example of that. We both trained to use the Earth and the stars 
to get our retro attitude. And that son of a gun landed closer to the carrier than I did, and he had no automatic control system at all. No horizon reference from the horizon scanners that would go like this outside. None of that worked. Back in those early days, here comes another one of those heavy jets. Yeah. That's probably Southwest. <laughs> I mean, boy, they fly right over the yeah. museum. Uh, but back in those early days, the photography portions of the mission mm. are not what they are today. You know, there's no Hubble telescope up there. No. You guys shot a lot of pictures. And it, it, you, it, in particular, took the time to learn how to shoot. Can you tell us about that? It was interesting because uh, Deke and I, Deke initially had the second orbital mission, and I was his backup. And that was changed when Deke had his physical problem. And then he was grounded, and Scott took that mission, so I was Scott's backup. So Deke and I had talked about getting a good camera, and we looked at the Hasselblad, and I finally got a Hasselblad camera. But before I got it, I talked to Ralph Morse and Carl Mydens of Life Magazine, Ken Weaver and Louis Morden of National Geographic. What's the best camera? Hasselblad. Really? All four of you agree? These were individual interviews, are really. But for this, but for that, we took all the but fors out, and made a perfect Hasselblad at the Cape. That was when uh, Pan Am had the laboratory down there. And Pan Am people made all these modifications. Victor Hasselblad came out with Hasselblad 500C, which was the, our version, <laughs> after we made those changes. We got some good pictures. I think I could have taken better pictures, but I was too busy doing other things. And Gordo, up there for over a day, got some absolutely gorgeous pictures with the Hasselblad he flew pictures that have now <clears throat> gone into the books of history. In retrospect, how would you place Mercury in the overall space program in the scheme of things? Mercury was the kickoff. We, uh, we made enough modifications in Mercury. We proved man could do a lot more than the machine could do. And with that, we, we had a working reliance, alliance is probably a better word, with McDonnell. And by then, we know Mr. Mr. Mack is like a father to us. Uh, Walter Burke, John Yardley are like brothers, as I say. That, that camaraderie took us all the way into Gemini. And when Gus got up there, after having backed me up on my Gemini, uh, no, no, Gus, see, now I'm just trying to put this in perspective. Gus had his flight, the second flight. And he was out of the loop. Gordo backed me up, and Al Shepard backed up Gordo. So Gus was out of the loop right away. He almost moved to St. Louis to work on Gemini. He was so disheartened about losing his Mercury that sank, which was not his fault. Uh, too many people have given blame for that, and I've pretty well cleared that one up. But at any rate, uh, Gus got the Gemini concept going very well. And oddly enough, everybody thought Gus was the smallest guy. He was the shortest guy, but not the smallest. He had the longest torso length. So Gus get, had enough room in there that Tom Stafford could fit in. A lot of people thought that we had to change things to get tall guys like Tom Stafford in. No. Gus had short legs but a long torso. Fascinating. Uh, you know, this brings to mind, I'm going to deviate from the mean of the hardware and let's talk about people. Mm. Let's talk about the original seven astronauts as you knew them. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just take them one by one and think about it. Well, go back over the seven. It was CCGGSSS. I'm the last of the smart S's. That goes on. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. Don't, don't wipe that one. That's one of my better lines. <laughs> well, what happened? We, uh, I didn't know any of the fellows. I, I, I met Al Shepard when we were up there for interviews in Washington. We stayed at a Marriott near the Pentagon, and the pool was frozen. We were ice skating. I remember doing that with Al. We got to know each other rather rapidly. Uh, we had three Navy, three Air Force, and one Jarhead a Marine by the name of Herschel Glenn. Uh, we, we were surprised about John when we first saw John at that press conference, because we just weren't prepared for something like that. John had done some international flight, not international, but national flight, been on, a, been on a uh, TV show. We all had set records, but John made, made lots of fun out of it. Yeah. And so John, uh, John had the presence in front of a camera in front of the press corps we didn't have. So we, we learned in a hurry because we were going to compete. And we seven competed with each other that we, be, we bonded so closely we're like brothers, still are. But sibling rivalry is also part of brotherhood. And we had a lot of that. How would you describe the guys one by one? Just a thumbnail. You know, Scott, 
I'm best described as being the uh, proponent for the song Yellowbird. <laughs> Scott loved music, and we got tired of hearing Yellowbird, but Scott was more of the dreamer than uh, the high technician, uh, hard-nosed chess pilot, fighter pilot. Uh, very competent, by the way, but uh, didn't portray the role of this hotshot flyboy. Uh, Gordo portrayed the role of the hotshot flyboy. Uh, he, a uh, sharp guy, uh, a couple of times were looked down on by Deke because he wasn't a test pilot uh, in flight test as Deke was. Gordo was involved with engineering tests. Uh, then we got to uh, John Glenn, who uh, made it quite clear what he was. <laughs> he was a Marine, <laughs> and uh, the Marines are different. Uh, we, we got along with John because he, he, he was a, a really a neat guy. We became very close. And, John took over some areas that we needed to take a look at and worked on them very hard. We worked on the flight control system as well as the Deke. Uh, Deke always complained about not having rudder pedals. He wanted rudder pedals. We couldn't have them, so we put yaw on the stick. So we got done with uh, Gus Grissom, right? He's probably the one that really hasn't been portrayed very well. Gus, little guy, sharp mind. Uh, Let's wait to let Jet go and yeah. save it for the dear old Gus. Mm. Okay, gotcha. Gus was an intent person, very intense, and his intent was to get things done right. Although uh, Gus could be a lot of fun, we played gotchas on each other all the time, tricks of course. I guess my favorite Gus one, uh, it was later when we were trying to do a Gemini vehicle, and we called it the Gusmobile. That, that's kind of where Gus was. He asserted himself and was so intent that it was obvious it was going to be his, his vehicle. And we called Gemini the Gusmobile. He uh, was trying to f fly a vehicle that would come down in a little parachute, like a hang glider, and almost didn't live through. He said, we're not going to do that. We all said, like, in that case, we're not going to do that. There was, well, you know, anybody else have another opinion? Nope, that, that's our opinion. And that's what Gus was like. Uh, Deke and Gus were very close. They were both Air Force and both had gone through the same hoops together, I suppose. Gus had had combat in Korea, and I guess those who have had combat look at the others with a little bit less, uh, not reserve, but less heroic worship, I suppose. John Glenn had combat. Deke had combat. I had combat. Al, Scott, and who's left? Deke Slayton had no combat time. And so You've forgotten one person in your description. Oh? Walter Marty Sherrod. I said I had combat. Yeah, you had combat, yeah. but you didn't describe yourself. Well, How would you describe yourself, Wally? A, a, I would say I was a truly committed flyboy, a test pilot. I'd had combat experience. I'd gone to China Lake where I developed the weapon Sidewinder, which is in production today, and this was done in 50, 51. Uh, I came from a flying family. I was very intent about it. One of the things I learned at the Naval Academy was the word commitment. I had made a commitment to be a naval officer, and I aspired to having command, and I felt very sad that I, when I left my Navy career, I was about ready to go to a squadron to be exec or skipper, my first command. I never had a command. And I regret that. I still do regret it. Uh, and that's why they teased me about my Apollo. He'll be commanding that flight, at least. Was, I even got something from the Navy Department, because they heard about it. When Apollo landed in the ocean, went down about maybe four or five feet and then bobbed back up the surface again. So I got a deep draft command thing that you were <laughs> presented by the Navy Department. <laughs> that was my only deep draft command. Mm -hmm. So even the Navy knew I was aspiring for command. But I, uh, I suspect I was hard over. I really wanted this thing to work right. I was known as Jolly Wally for a long time until I got mad at Apollo. And then once in a while I get kind of tight. But why did I get mad? I lost my next door neighbor, Gus Grissom, who was killed in the launch pad. And I, I didn't feel very good about that. And I, I, I wanted things to go properly. I didn't want to make any abrupt changes. So that kind of attitude was always in me, but it, it never surfaced. I didn't need to have it happen. I had a good time in Mercury. I had a good time in Gemini doing that rendezvous. That was a ball. Let's get back to that, though, because right now you're into a, a, a rather critical mm. element of your career. Mm. That was the Apollo 7 mission. And so let's let's dive in there first and then we can go okay. back to Gemini, shall we? Sure. Well, what happened with Apollo was a, an amazing series of events that happened. Initially, Gus Grissom and his crew had the first Apollo flight, Block 1. My crew, Cunningham and Isley, had the second flight. 
And I saw this as a very dumb flight. And I campaigned to have that flight canceled. There were a lot of scientific experiments that I said, we're trying to get to the moon before this decade is out. If you remember what Mr. Kennedy told us, let's get on with that. We wasted a lot of time flying Grissom on a second flight on Redstone. We were about to fly a third one, and John got his orbital flight instead because we picked up momentum. I said, why should we duplicate two Block 1 flights, neither of which prove a thing about Block 2 and the capability of going to the moon and back? I will say moon and back. So I asked myself out of that mission, thinking I'd have the first Block 2 mission. Suddenly, I'm now black, back up to Gus. I said, wow, I just lost a command role. And that kind of bothered me no end, because I had been back up to Scott, I'd been back up to Gus. And I, this was going on and on and on. I said, I'm a little tired of being a backup. But uh, as it was, I took that role on, not with the guarantee of having another chance at an Apollo mission, by the way. I was kind of chapped about that. We were saying, well, we are Mercury astronauts. You are a Mercury astronaut. You might have a Gemini. But Apollo, that's really the next team. I said, oh, that's interesting. You want me to be a backup with nothing to look forward to? No deal. Oh, well, no, I'm sorry, we'll back that off. This is Deke and Al talking that way. The other two smart S's. And <laughs> I went along with this for a while. But then uh, when we lost Gus on the pad, suddenly I have the first Block 2 flight. And I realized this is not very nice. I'm taking over a mission that my buddy was not able to fly. That was a tough, tough one. So with that, we went through a lot of trauma. NASA. Unfortunately, as a bunch of civilians, didn't know how to take off the black armband. And military people moan inside, cry inside, bleed inside about losing a compatriot. But they wear the black armband to the funeral, and that's it. It's gone. NASA wore the black armband for a year. And we kept saying, look, take the band off. We've got to get back to work. Gus, Gus would be the first person to say, let's get on with it. Do good work. And that was the kind of attitude I had going into Apollo. I was a little annoyed about how the spacecraft was prepared. The one that, I'll right come back, yeah. Cut. Now, you were a little yeah, I was, yeah. with the way. I, I was annoyed at the way what became Apollo 1 came out of the plant at Downey. It, it, it was not finished. It was what they call a lot of uncompleted work or incomplete tests and work done on it. So it was shipped to the Cape with a bunch of spare parts and things to finish it out. And that, of course, caused this whole atmosphere of developing where I would almost call it a first case of bad go fever. And go fever meaning we've got to keep going, got to keep going, got to keep going. When my crew did the test that was followed by Gus and his guys, we were in a sea level atmosphere, no, no pure oxygen. We were in shirt sleeves. And there were things going on I didn't like at all. I was no longer annoyed. I was a really pretty goddamn mad. There were glitches, electronic things that just didn't come out right. That evening, I debriefed with Joe Shea and Gus. And I said, if there are any things that go wrong, like a glitch in the electronic circuit, some bad sounds, scrub. Because Gus and his guys were going to do it in pure oxygen in an environment that's not very forgiving. We didn't realize how unforgiving it was at that point. We'd gone through the same environment with Mercury and Gemini and made it through. Not that I think of it in that way, but that's how I look at it in retrospect. Gus, I can recall saying, if I can't talk to the blockhouse, how the hell are we going to go to the moon with this damn thing? That's how bad the communications were. He should have scrubbed. He didn't. He was himself involved in Go Fever. Yeah. No, I, with, that, with that thought in mind, when I picked up the Block 2 spacecraft, I said, all of these things will be completed in the plant in Downey before it leaves the plant. I might add, today, even though we're doing an interview at some X point in time, I talked to Fred Peters, our NASA engineer, just today about Fisher Pen, trying to make a memento of the Apollo 7 on the Fisher Pen and a turtle, by the way. <laughs> just today, Fred Peters. I talked to John Healy and Fred Peters every October between October 11 and October 22nd. And they both say, thank you, Wally, for a good mission. And yet, I wanted it to be a perfect mission. When we left Downey, John Healy and Fred Peters were the last guy in it, and they did a tumbling exercise. Take the spacecraft on multi-axis and whip it around, try to get all the spare things loose if it falls out, and they take them out and put them away. 
in orbit, I found a washer and a little nut, a little tiny bolt, and I presented each one of those guys one of these pieces, <laughs> which they didn't find. But that friendship developed from the sense of perfection, because I had been annoyed. I said, I'm not going to mess around with an incomplete vehicle. When we got it to the Cape, Healy and I were there, and I never forget, it's Buzz Sebastian Hello said, well, nice of you to be here, fellas. I'm glad you're here. I said, don't you touch a damn thing. This thing is perfect. It's going to stay that way. Whoa. And that's the same time he said, is there anything else you need? Because now he's getting a little, I wonder if this guy's really real. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm serious. We lost a crew on the launch pad. I want Gunter Vent, the pad leader that I had for Mercury and Gemini, to be hired by North American Rockwell and be our pad leader. I can pick this up easily. <laughs> Buzz Hello said, I'll get you a Barbie doll if you want. I said, you don't understand what I'm saying. I want to go up there so hard-nosed, I want a pad Fuhrer up there. And we'll not have go fever. We'll have nothing going wrong. We'll still do checks for dust <laughs> and play games with each other, but I want a pro. And we had Gunter Vent for every Apollo flight. And guess what? They all work perfectly. Matter of fact, Gunter stayed with North American for quite a long time. Yes. What and the fun of it was, and I, I, I might as well put this on camera, the last thing that happens when you mount up an Apollo, the clean room is ready to draw back, and the last person you can see, and only one person can see, and that's Don Isley, the only window that has an opening, through the hatch looking back at the clean room, looks back and says, I wonder if I'm going to vent. And I've got to admit, he said that. I've stolen it, and I'll use it every time I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, during the mission, of course, you had the misfortune of also catching a cold, so did the rest of your team. Did that influence the flight? The cold did. It made us uh, a little short, but I was short before we took off. I, uh, in a meeting at Downey, walked into an open door meeting, dark room. They were discussing the couches that we would fly in this Block 2 spacecraft that were going to be block one couches. And I said, oh, what does that mean? They all turned, oh, what, 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 oh, oh, hi, Wally. Well, this, we can't get the block two couches ready in time. I said, well, what's the difference? Well, the block one really can't take a land landing. Oh, have a new mission rule then, don't we? What's that? We don't launch if the wind's going to blow us back over the beach. I guess that's a good mission rule. Guess what? We launched, and the wind was going to blow us back over the beach. So someone broke that rule. I didn't. I was compromised. And I, again, it was a case of a little, a little go fever, not as bad as the real bad cases of go fever, but it was enough to make me annoyed, and that's that's bad form. Then uh, in orbit, we launched on a Friday. I remember this very specifically. In orbit, our so-called Friday night, Don Isley's on watch, and Cunningham and I are supposed to be sleeping. And I hear Don saying, "Wally won't like that." <laughs> what was that? Put on my mic and listen in. Oh, we're supposed to put on the uh, television tomorrow morning. Well, we didn't have that in the schedule, gentlemen. That doesn't go on until Sunday morning. I should have said, I don't want to interrupt Howdy Doody. But <laughs> that would have gotten away with it. <laughs> but I really was saying, we have not checked this system out. It's in the flight plan to be checked at this point in time. We'll check it at that point in time. We did. We did the Wally Walton Don show Sunday. But by then, Everybody said, these guys are getting testy up there. They're, they're, they're not mutiny, but they're, they're not going along with the flight controllers. I have yet to meet a flight controller that ever died falling out of a chair like this. That was my whole attitude from then on. Don't mess with me, guys. <laughs> this is my command, and I wasn't kidding. And I'll take all the advice, all the, all the information you can give me, but don't push us around. We're, we're still worried about whether this is a safe spacecraft or not. And we had a we had even got to a point where they were going to shave all our hair off in case it was a fire. Now, why am I going to start running a TV show for somebody if I haven't checked the camera out? All electrical circuits, piece by piece. Aha, uh -huh, it works. Now I'll show you TV. Oddly enough, we got an Emmy for that Wally Walton Don show. <laughs> so I can't really say it was a bad deal. Coming as it did, too, on the heels of the disaster, this was a tremendously important flight from a NASA point of view. It really had to be. It had to be perfect. That was, I, I was so thrilled because I was at the Cape recently and I saw Sam Phillips drive. Sam Phillips, then a general, called that mission 101%, which was Spacecraft 101, by the way. But that, that thrilled me no end that Sam saw that what I was trying to do was to make it at least 101%.
the crew that you flew with? Did you pick them? No, I did not pick my crew. Uh, Don and Walt were assigned by Deke. Uh, Don was easy to work with. Walt was very difficult to work with. Uh, my wife said, and Walt's heard me say this, so it's not out of school, he's like a puppy dog. Scratch it behind the ears and he'll do anything you want. When I stopped scratching him behind the ears, it was real hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the flight of Apollo 7, uh, did you think that your career would continue within NASA? Oh, no. Prior to the flight of Apollo 7, a lot of people don't remember that, I announced I was retiring, leaving NASA, and possibly retiring from the Navy prior to the flight. So I had that in my little data bank. I hadn't really committed to retiring from the Navy yet, but I was definitely leaving NASA. There's another world out there waiting for you. Well, I also knew, having almost not had an Apollo flight at all, if you go back to that point in time, there was no way of going to get another Apollo flight. And it turned out no crew commander was to get a second Apollo flight. And the only one that broke that rule was Tom Stafford on Apollo Soyuz. Now, others had flown twice in Apollo, but not as a commander. So I knew that my destiny was there. I, I, was, I was gone. And I, I knew the space station, Skylab, would take too long for me to get involved. We had to go through all the lunar landings, all of that, and I'd seen these transitions from Mercury to Gemini, Gemini to Apollo. Those are long, hard, dry spells. I had no idea how long shuttle would take, although it had been talked about. All right, I think then this is the time now to go back into Gemini, mm. because we were just finishing up Mercury. Yeah. We deviated to get across this solid story mm -hmm. of the Apollo. Good. Let's go into Gemini just a bit. Uh, let's first of all talk about the big step up, down, or was it in between, mm. between Mercury and Gemini? What was the difference? I, I without doubt, say Gemini was my favorite flight. Gemini, Gemini, either one, quite correct. I recall Bob Gilworth in an airplane one time, flying commercially somewhere, back before we flew Gemini or Gemini. I said, Bob, uh, these women walking up and down the aisle, they're, they're stewards, or stewardesses, right? What do you call them in plural? Are they steward I or are they steward E? They're hostesses. Thud. <laughs> so it turned out Gemini or Gemini, either is correct. It's either Arabic or some other language, Latin, you know, I guess. We, the television media, once went to Walt Williams, and we said, now, we don't care which way you throw it up, but come down with an honest answer. We have to know whether it's Gemini or Gemini. Yeah. And he said, he thought for a moment, and he said, Gemini. I said, okay, so be it. From this point in, all the television guys will always call it Gemini. And yeah, we did. I, I've called it Gemini most of the time, yeah. Gemini 6, that's the way I call it. Yeah. Well, what, what has happened in time? Gemini has been forgotten. There were no major stunts, like the first man in space, or the first man on the moon, or the first woman in space. So as a result, Gemini just fell down the crack. Yet without that mission, we could not have gone to the moon and back. There were four things Gemini did. One, guide itself through re-entry, actually change its pattern to come back into a landing point, which you had to do if you're coming back from the moon, endure in space for two weeks, take a spacesuit outside the spacecraft and do something, and do a rendezvous. I was so thrilled to do the rendezvous mission, that, that's why I love the mission, but... We're away from that jet We're now we're coming up to yeah. We loosely, we, the media, loosely labeled 76. Yeah. 76. You know, your mission, first of all, as with all space flights, there were highlights, there were lowlights, there were moments of great adventure. Mm -hmm. And one of them you shared by virtue of being a pilot who knew when not to fly. Uh -huh. Would you like to go back <laughs> over that? Well, it's kind of interesting because the Gemini 6 initially was GTA, Gemini Titan Atlas, or Agena, excuse me, Gem Gemini Titan Agena. Six. Our first attempt to launch, we lost the Agena. It didn't make it into orbit. Second attempt, amazingly, John Yardley and Walter Burke conceived of the idea of Gemini 6 taking off after Gemini 7 and using it as a target for rendezvous. I said, wow, can we do that? Now, this same group that I gave the name Sigma to put this all together, got us all set up to launch within seven days after Gemini 7 took off. We're on the launch pad, go through the countdown. Three, two, one, zero. Clock started, liftoff, negative liftoff. A plug fell out. The engine started and whoom, and shut down. Mission controls had liftoff. Launch controls had liftoff. My clock started. 
I didn't say lift off. Having had the experience of being in Mercury, having lifted off, I knew the difference. I, I, I think even Tom Stafford will admit today he wasn't sure. I was sure. Now, our choices were rather limited. We could stay there and blow up, <laughs> or we could stay there and it was safe, or we could eject, and that would be the end of the mission once and for all. And I would have ejected if I had to. I know that. A lot of people say, you, you didn't want to reject. I said, baloney. <laughs> Old Watashi wants to live through it. We'll discuss the mission later. But the, uh, the result of it was that plug that fell out, we caused another engineering test to go on, and they found another series of plugs that said in the sequence, remove the dust plugs. Didn't say how many. I have a, one of those little things that was not removed. It would have shut down a second time. I probably would have ejected that time. As it was the third time we got off, did our rendezvous, had a great time uh, seeing these guys with all their laundry hanging out. Of course, it wasn't hanging out, it was just junk around the back. <laughs> the, uh, the mission was, was one of my very favorites because we had rehearsed it over and over and over and over again with all these months in between. I even had Hubert Humphrey, then Vice President of the United States, in the right seat with me in the docking simulator. And that was even, that, that, that's how much time we had. In fact, that's one of my favorite stories about a nice man, Hubert Humphrey. He, this dark room, we're sliding around on these air-bearing cushions and up, down, right, left, and the Eugene is moving around, so we have all six degrees of freedom. And I'm supposed to come in and dock with it. They stop me, and I'm essentially frozen. Dark room, ladder comes up, and this man comes out and opens the hatch, gets in. Hi, Wally. Hi, Mr. Vice President. It's Hubert Humphrey. What if I join you? No, no, please do. Close the hatch. Can they hear us outside? No, sir. I want to take a five minute nap. Will you wake me in about five minutes? Yes, sir. <laughs> I go do my thing. Wake him up five minutes later. He said, what were we doing? Well, I'll spend another minute and show you. <laughs> you can turn on the sound again. <laughs> Isn't that a fun story about a nice man? That is, that's a remarkable yeah. story. But we spent, that's how much time we had to do those kind of things. We didn't have the Gina to dock with, but all that precise maneuvering with my left hand, even though I write left handed, most things I do with my right hand, but now from pitch, roll, and yaw, now we have forward, back, up, down, right, left. And now I have dexterity in both hands, so I was a hell of a good translation man. <laughs> Again, it was little tiny, tiny thrusts. Uh, there's a term we use, which will probably come out of the tape, but I wanted the smallest amount of thrust I could get, I call it a micro mouse fart. <laughs> That'll never make it through the editor, but it's still a... <laughs> you never could tell. <laughs> it might make it. <laughs> well, fart's not a dirty word anymore, no? <laughs> well, not the Germans. No, really. that's right, Ausfart. <laughs> well, you know German, they're very good. Mm -hmm. But I wanted something, if I made a maneuver where I would come right a little bit, I wanted to come like this and then stop and come back a little bit and stop. That's why the shuttle can dock with Mir today or dock with the space station in the future. You've got to have these very slow minimal attitude changes where you don't waste a lot of fuel. And that's where we developed that technique to perfection. And from then on, we did docking without, without any hesitation at all. All the Gemini flights were successful in docking. You know, it brings to mind, too, uh, it seems to me I remember some signs being hung out of windows, like beat Army, beat Navy. <laughs> Was it, wasn't there something like that? Can you remember that for me? It's rather interesting. Just recently, uh, four Gemini astronauts got together in Dayton, Ohio to induct Jim Lovell into the Hall of Fame. The other three of us had already been inducted. So Tom Stafford and I, who were Gemini Six, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell were there. We were doing these photographs, and the people who were doing the photographs was for Vanity Fair. We wanted to do a Mount Rushmore pose, all heads, and looked like old, old men. At any rate, other scenes were taken, other pictures were taken. This photographer had asked one of his crewmen to call me before I went back. Can you think of something that would make the guys laugh? And I said, yes, make a big sign that says Beat Army. <laughs> we did hold it up and Frank Borman fell apart laughing. But now why did I do that? When we did the rendezvous, knowing we could do it, got within about two feet of the other window, the other spacecraft tree, you just put the windows together, you don't have to put the noses together. Frank Borman is a West Point graduate. With him is Jim Lovell, a Naval Academy graduate. With me, although we went to the Air Force, Tom Stafford, Naval Academy, and I'm Naval Academy. Naturally, I had to hold up the sign, beat Army. <laughs> Frank Borman topped me, though. I don't really remember that or not. He said, look at that sign. It says, beat Navy. The heck it does. <laughs> well, that's in a museum at the Naval Academy, I might add, that sign. <laughs> Funny thing is, we did have some tape with some film of that. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'd like to see. It's I haven't around. seen that footage. It's around somewhere. I don't quite know where. As a matter of fact, you know, you can straighten something out for us. At that time in Gemini, the thing was being labeled either in Roman numerals or in numbers. Yeah. Which was right, the Roman numerals or the I've used I've used both. I think my patch has a, a six like the, like that for the, your viewpoint, but also the VI. <laughs> Nobody ever really quite figured that no, out. No, no. Or straightened it out, let's put no. it that way. Also, let's see, Houston took over mission control with Gemini. You were breaking in a whole new, Gemini 4 was uh, it? Actually, Where Jim McDivitt and Ed White were the last to use that mission control center at the Cape. Yep. Oddly enough, by the way, and to put this on camera, I just got some correspondence from a guy, trying, Lufkin, I think his name is Ludkin, who's trying to save mission control at the Cape, which is on Air Force land, but NASA building. And NASA has gone along with the idea of moving it over to Kennedy Space Center, which then takes an N historical, like that N historical site, breaks it down and moves it to someplace else. I think that's wrong, really wrong. The, uh, we, uh, I can vividly recall pictures. I was just in there, oh, less, well, during John Glenn's prep period. I went to that same mission control, sat in the same console. I recall talking to Gordo from there. I can recall Al Shepard talking to John Glenn from there. I can Chris Craft in back of us. And the Chris Craft wouldn't dare come on the line unless the Capcom gave him permission, if you remember that. <laughs> but that, uh, that was the way we were all buddies. Chris is a little younger than I. I didn't realize. I always thought he was older than I. We were all the same age. He and we acted older. And we, we, he did very well. He was the boss. Yeah. <laughs> but he was the boss of the flight directors. I know that. <laughs> Do you have any memories of other Gemini flights, let's say, for instance, Gemini 8? You were. Oh, Gemini 8, my gosh. Uh, Frank Borman, Susan, his wife, Joe, my wife, and I had to do a Southeast Asia tour for then President Johnson on an airplane described as Air Force One. We went to Japan, we went to uh, Korea, went to uh, Taiwan, to China with Chiang Kai-shek, met all these leaders of the countries, met Marcos in the Philippines. Uh, Went into Australia, of course, uh, had a birthday party. Frank Borman's birthday is two days after mine. Mine is March 12th, Frank's is March 14th. The Prime Minister of Australia had a party for us on March the 13th when we were there. That's how I remember that so well. He was the one that was lost at sea sometime later. We came back to Hawaii with all our little goodies, got through customs, which is a nightmare in those days. It still is, in fact. <laughs> and the next thing I know, I'm on the beach and I get a phone call. Come to the phone. I get to the phone. An admiral calls and said, uh, Armstrong and Dave Scott have landed in the Pacific. They want you to take the airplane back and pick them up. Oh, wait. <laughs> so I told Frank, you got the gals. You got all the loot. <laughs> take it all back to the main loot. I've got the airplane. We'll go out to Wokinau and pick up Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott who had trouble, of course, with the uh, stuck thruster in their Gemini spacecraft, which caused them to spin rather violently. And they lost their attitude control fuel to a level where they had to re-enter immediately, and they re-entered near Okinawa. Interesting story about Okinawa, by the way. It's one of my favorite Gemini stories. I'm with a fellow by the name of John Fesseling, about six foot five. His assistant head of protocol in Washington. Very robust looking Italian guy. I said, John, I'm in civvies. I, I, I don't want to get involved now. I've got to get these guys off that little destroyer and put them into security and take them back to Hawaii so we can debrief them. We don't want any interruptions. I got that. So we're standing there, and all of a sudden, cars start driving up with three stars, four stars, generals, admirals. All of them have a platoon of generals and admirals. A big band starts coming in, and they're all lining up with their tubas, all the brass stuff, and all the whole thing. I, my God, this is going to be a big event. Got bigger and bigger, so I'm, I'm retreating away from this whole group, father and father. John, you got to get them off that boat and get them out of here in a hurry. We had a helicopter standing by. This destroyer comes in, having picked up Neil and Dave and their Gemini spacecraft. It was so light in the water, because he's racing back to Buckner Bay, Okinawa. As he came into the dock, he blew it and went right on by, and the band's boom pop pop boom pop pop and the platoon of admirals and generals was saluting like mad. <laughs> right on by. You can see him up in the bridge, all ahead, all ahead, stern, stern. <laughs> Starts hitting the power, backs up, roars back by the band, boom pop pop boom pop pop boom pop pop right on by the dock again. <laughs> Makes a third pass. This one animal said, if you get a line over this time, I'll sink the son of a bitch. 
<laughs> that was the recovery of Gemini 8. <laughs> uh, you know, that brings to mind, what was your last assignment as an astronaut? What did you do to round out that career with NASA? I was uh, on the accident board for Neil Armstrong's uh, simulator, the flying simulator for the lunar module, and trying to determine what had happened. It was very obvious that the machine itself had failed. Okay. Um, Wally, what would you think, looking back over it, you flew Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. Mm -hmm. What do you think was your biggest contribution to the space program? I used the word earlier, commitment. I made a commitment to doing the things I could do within the time frame I was willing to do it, which is almost 10 years to the day, uh, April to July, really, uh, 10 years of doing what I thought was appropriate, to get man into space, to make man perform in space, and make the prelude to going to the moon and back. And all those things were done. I, I, th I thought I had a good time. Well, there were some things in there that I'm sure you look back on and say, that was a key to the space program. Uh, that, I, really, I really did something there as compared to just mm -hmm. doing the job that you had to do. Well, I, I would say I enjoyed Gemini fully. I did Apollo. I was amazed, frankly, when John Glenn, who had only five hours in space, was anxious to go up there for, was it, 8.3 days or 9.3 days. I was bored to tears up there for 11 days. I mean bored. Uh, fighter pilots like to fly for an hour, hour and a half, come back and do something else. Maybe two flights a day, three flights a day, and you go to the bar. Unless you have a flight the next day, then you don't go to the bar. And to sit up there for 11 days, oh, that was so bad. Remember those little bands you'd wear around your wristwatch for the calendar? I have that band in a plastic block with eight of the 11 days scratched off like a prisoner. That plastic block and the band are in the Smithsonian, in the Air and Space Museum. Are you saying you really wouldn't like to fly on the space shuttle with the nine, ten-day missions that they fly? I would not at all be interested. I'd love to land the shuttle. Everything else, been there, done that, even have a shirt. <laughs> well, the shuttle, of course, was the next generation. Sure. Now, let me make a point of that, though. There are people who enjoy being up there for a long period of time. I've talked to, uh, oh, I'm just trying to think of the fellow on Th Norm Th there are people who enjoy being up there. Norm Thagard had, I think, four flights. He had 111 days in Mir. 111. I'm bitching about 11. That's 100 days more. And he came back as a scientist, engineer and a scientist, enjoying that. I've, I wouldn't even get in that dumb Mir. I saw it in 1991. I said, what a bucket of bolts this thing is. I wouldn't have flown that. I saw it in 91. I wouldn't have flown that in, in 61, let alone 62. Yet there are people, scientists, and educated people who feel that they can do something constructive. That's their goal. That's not my goal. I guess that's the difference between the people who will fly on the International Space Station, too, isn't it? I, I, they're not really going up no. there to be pilots. They're going up there to be scientists. To do work, scientists. sure. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it would be a crime to have a pilot go up there and sit around for months at a time. And in fact, you haven't seen many do that if you look at it. And mo most of those who've been up there for a long time left NASA in a hurry, I've noticed that too. But the, the concept of the space station is important if we're going to go all the way to Mars and back. We're talking at least two years, maybe three, for a total mission. So you've got to select people who are willing to stay in that dumb environment for that long. You can't eat out. <laughs> and the entertainment's pretty limited. So I, I would say you have to be a totally different kind of person than a hotshot fighter pilot. And that's essentially what I thought I am. If you could start all over again, would you like to command a flight to Mars? No way, no, no. Too long. It's too long. Uh, by the way, even to command a shuttle flight, in my mind, would be too long. To command it, I would want at least two years to be properly prepared to fly that mission and command the mission. Well, that's, that's a whole different ballgame, flying that spacecraft, isn't it? It is. I, I flew the simulator in Houston one time and crashed on the landing. I said, oh, oh I better practice this. And of course, it was the first time I had no cues or anything. I just said, this, uh, uh, the young astronaut was checking me out, laughed, said, I could have helped live it there. Well, I said, I know, I know, I know. But this is the, when you can walk away from a landing, you call it a good landing. I'm not sure I could have walked away from that one. <laughs> but it taught me a lesson, though. You've got to spend a lot of time, as I did in the simulators, to fly a vehicle safely under any 
possible circumstance that might come up. We trained out fear. We did not want any surprises at all. I, I almost have a semantic lecture I start out with. We can't afford the luxury of fear. Because if you have fear, you're out of control. If you're out of control, you're going to die. So you, you have to avoid surprises because surprises conjure up fear. Well, they make you afraid, we'll say. If you go on beyond all that, all I can afford is a little bit of apprehension. Not a whole bunch of apprehension either. Interesting progression from a pilot's point of view. I'm looking now at Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and on into space mm -hmm. shuttle. From a pilot's point of view, how would you size up step by step that progression? Everything was the same other than practicing that landing. And they practiced that with, a, I think it was a G2. They may still use that Gulfstream 2 with gear flaps and speed brakes and almost thrust reverses to get that unbelievable glide slope. This is a power off landing. We, uh, oh, that's the shuttle, of course. The shuttle. So when yeah, you put now at the progression from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo, in terms of the pilot, ah, ah, I'm the sorry, the missions, and then moving on to the shuttle. Mm. Well, Mercury, the flight path was predestined. You were on a ballistic flight around the world, so you just went fast enough. So you just kept going around the world until you slowed down. And you came down. If you fired the retro rockets at exactly the right time in the right attitude, you'd come as I did and as Gordo did within four miles of the ship. I'm still convinced the ship was four miles out of position, but... <laughs> so your, your piloting task was merely maneuvering, not maneuvering, changing the attitude of the spacecraft. That's all you could do. You couldn't maneuver the spacecraft. An airplane, if you pull back on the stick, the airplane goes up. Pull back on the stick and Mercury, all you do is pitch up. You don't go up or down. There's no aerodynamic flow. So you're just changing your view. In Gemini, you change all of these things. So Gemini was a real control task. The only task that you might describe in Mercury was getting your proper retro attitude so you were in the proper attitude to fire the retro rockets. That's about the only attitude you really had to have. And the, the chimp had that by having automatic control. In Gemini, you, you could change your flight path by rotating. The center of lift was off from the center of mass, center of gravity. So if you rolled it, you could go left or right, ultimately changing your flight path downrange. So you'd go left, right, left, right, left, right, you'd land shorter. If you did nothing, you'd land longer. We call that a footprint, like the sole of your foot. And you could fly either side of the footprint or the length of it. And those are pretty good distances, like miles. And that, uh, that meant that you were actually controlling it through the atmosphere on reentry. Why was that important? If you come back from the moon in Apollo, and can't control your attitude through the atmosphere. You either bounce off the atmosphere and go into solar orbit, which makes it a very long mission, or you punch in too deeply and you're going to cook or kill yourself from high acceleration. So it's very precise flight control. Now, to make that even more accurate, we then went into celestial navigation, inertial guidance for Apollo, which now threw in a very big computer, very crude, but it worked, where we looked at those stars, identifying each star, and realigned the inertial guidance system to where we, we essentially moved our state vector, which is an arrow in space, either decreased its length or we'd move it around. That's where we're going to go with time. And that was all inertial guidance. So you're not looking out the window anymore, looking at Earth for retro attitude. You're flying it with your guidance system, and it's now a computer telling you what to do. So Apollo went from this real fun of flying Gemini to almost a, an automatic mission back towards Mercury again. And from there, then they transitioned into space shuttle. And since you did some simulations, mm. how would you rate the difference in flying shuttles as compared to the earlier spacecraft? Mm. Shuttle, for one, I don't like because there's no escape system. They talk about this dinky kind of escape system. You slide out a rod and come down and put on your parachute. And they showed the crew, at least John Glenn recently, dunking in the water. Well, that, that'd be very nice if you got that close to the water and still alive. But there are only a short period of time you can use that escape system. And Chris Kraft corrected me during the ABC broadcast on John's flight. I said, well, the solid rockets are your escape system. I said, yeah, but you can't turn them off. So you're stuck with these solid rockets. The solid rockets we had in Mercury and in Apollo would pull you away from the booster if it was going to blow. And then you come down in your parachute system. Shuttle, you've got to land it or you've got to climb out. The time frame where you can climb out is very limited. So that, that's one. But now the shuttle can do something that the others could never do. That's land on a runway. 
Now, people always ask me, what was the most beautiful view from Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo? The parachute. <laughs> if it didn't come out, it was a lousy ride. <laughs> but with shuttle, you can land almost anywhere. There's a good runway, and you have time to get to it. In retrospect, what would you say was the most difficult thing that you had to do in connection with the American space program? All right, I just said, what was the most difficult aspect of your involvement in the space program? The most difficult part, probably the funerals. I think about it. We lost some, obviously we lost three from Apollo 1. Uh, I thought, by the way, the television series from the Earth to the Moon was very well done. And they showed me there, or Mark Harmon, who portrayed me in my Navy captain uniform uh, with Betty Grissom, the widow. And it, it hit me hard just seeing that all over again. We uh, very rarely wore our uniforms other than to visit the Chief of Naval Operations or View Air or a funeral. Eisenhower was the president. Everybody gives Kennedy the nod, but Eisenhower is what started the manned space program, said this will be an open program to the world. And so we never had the security of hiding behind our uniforms, looking anonymous with the uniform. We were thrown to the press corps, literally. So we, that might be the second most difficult part, was the number of public appearances that we had to go through. Uh, we had a routine, we called it week in the barrel. We had to go around the country visiting various congressmen or having press media. Now I get paid for doing that. <laughs> but in those days, that was pretty difficult for a, uh, a guy from a small town of 2200. NASA still makes its astronauts available to the media, and I think rightly so. Somebody's got to explain yeah. all the intricacies of the business. In contrast, I wish NASA would pay more attention to the astronauts and get them closer to the media. When I was asked, by media people, and I'm looking at Mark as well, to talk to this newspaper or this magazine or this television crew about John Glenn's flight. I said, I'll talk to you if you give me the name of the crew commander of STS-95. We'll call you back. Don't bother. John Glenn liked that. It was Kirk Brown, of course. But I heard the name of the next mission. I have forgotten. I don't know. That's sad. But I don't know the name of the crew commander of the mission before either. We've got to publicize these crew because they're the ones that got the press corps excited, getting name identity out. Sometime you and I will have a debate about that. <laughs> well, it, 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 the, every shuttle mission has been dull. I have yet to find something that makes it exciting. Uh, the, the reports that come out of it, have you heard anything about STS-95? I have not heard a thing. It's almost a month now. Mm -hmm. And we, we are, we're, we're, we're not feeding information out. Uh, I have mixed emotions about the space station, whether I really believe in it or not. But if we have man's quest to go from Earth to someplace else other than the moon, which would be Mars, we've got to qualify people and equipment in Earth orbit for a protracted period of three years, which is involved with that lunar or that Mars mission. Or we may as well send unmanned missions. Now, if it's to justify a future for astronauts, that's not a good way to do it. So somehow we've got to start telling the story about the human involvement. That's what made, it what made it exciting about going to the moon. Has anybody talked about Apollo 10 or 12? It's Apollo 11. Now why is that? We, we, uh, we had a heck of a good series of flights. I, I can recall when I was broadcasting with Walter Cronkite, how to get to the Cape for Apollo 11, we went out by helicopter. I could go out and roller skates for Apollo 12. Just, the first time I saw a large number of people at the Cape since Apollo 11 was STS-95 with John Glenn. Now that means that the human being has some factor in this thing to get the excitement up. Now whether that's going to go on for a while or not, I don't know. We'll know eventually whether that made a big impact or not. Don't you think, Wally, when you fly more than 100 manned missions of different types, that the public at large keeps looking for something different and there isn't something different to really offer them because basically these flights are bread and butter flights. And especially the next 45 while you're putting yeah. together a space station, which is like watching grass grow. Well, they're going to have some fun on, the, uh, on these spacewalks, on building the space station. I, I can recall so vividly, I even talked to Alexei Leonov. He said he almost died 
first spacewalk, Soviet cosmonaut. Almost couldn't get back in again. Gene Cernan almost couldn't get back in again. Almost died up there. The only guy that really did a first good spacewalk in Germany was Buzz Aldrin, because he took advantage of all the other flights and worked in the underwater tank, perfected his maneuvers, and we finally had a good spacewalk. The only guy that did very well with the spacewalk was Shepard, although he took a mulligan on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> he shanked it. <laughs> but, but the whole point is, this is a very difficult task. This back that same suit I was involved in. And the worst sound you can ever hear is sss. That can ruin your whole day. Now these guys are gonna be, and gals, I guess, they'll be working on some pretty complicated equipment. And it's very possible they could puncture their suit and that would probably bring a lot of media attention, I'll say that. But they're going to be working awfully hard to put all of these various pieces together, making all these components. We're building something locally in San Diego called Legoland. This is Lego Mile. <laughs> it's going to be a big one. As a matter of fact, as you look at the construction phases, it will be surprising indeed if there aren't some moments of high drama in putting together that space station with 45 missions mm. at least. I, I, it's, it's awfully hard to comprehend. It, Initially, when we first started talking seriously about shuttle, each shuttle was supposed to have 100 flights. We have not had 100 flights total at this point in time. We're approaching it, 95, but some of the, that was a higher number. So I think it's a 93 coming. But we're getting close to 100 flights, which is the equivalent of one shuttle. So we've got a lot, of, a lot more flights to go, allegedly, although I'm not sure the shuttle will last that long. Well, the shuttle will be a tug of sorts. That's what it's supposed to have been. There will be replacements, will there not? Mm -hmm. For shuttle? Yeah. The, uh, on the drawing board, there are some concepts for replacements of shuttle. I think they call it the X-33 or something like that. 38. Is it the 38? 38. 38? 33? 38's the crew. Oh, that 38's the flying one. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, now you want to really get me excited about flying that? Yeah. You were a passenger like Glenn was on that shuttle flight. There are no flight controls for the crew to fly the 38. It's a, it's a back to chip mode again, which really impressed the hell out of it. But why? You don't need a pilot to do all those hotshot flyboy things. You've got to have technicians, scientists, uh, medical per people. This is what the space station is all about. Transfer vehicle. It's a transfer vehicle, which is what Soyuz has always been. Soyuz is not flown by the cosmonauts. So maybe, maybe they were smarter than we were. But we had to do those tasks because we didn't have automated systems that could land on the moon and get back again at that time. Now we have. You think we should go back to the moon? I was told that half of the lunar samples that were brought back from the moon are in storage in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory waiting for newer, equip newer equipment to look at it. I also reminisce about that great man, Von Braun who was a dear friend of ours. He uh, entertained the seven of us at his home shortly after we were selected. Showed us engineering drawings on how to go into space that were used in their preliminary studies back in the time frame of World War II. That's how far ahead he was. Now, Verna wasn't too good on spacecraft, but he was sure good on boosters. But he did say something about the moon I thought was really prophetic. Whatever you bring back from the moon, whatever piece of material you bring back, if you compare it to investment grade diamonds, which is worth $40,000 a carat, it's not worth it, but the knowledge is. That's a very good statement. Well, Lonnie, we've pretty well covered all the bases I had in mind. Is there anything else that uh, yeah. you'd like to tuck into this interview? Because right now is a grand chance to put one down for posterity. We're talking about Werner von Braun. I, I really, you've got to have this one on film. Whenever we went to a an event where maybe 10 to 100 people were, and Werner von Braun was there. Werner would say, Vardy, tell the cosmonaut story. Yeah, Werner, I tell the story. <laughs> well, you'll tell the story after yeah, the yeah. goes by. <laughs> Werner would say, Vardy, tell the astronaut cosmonaut story. Yeah, Werner, I tell that story. You have to imagine now, no one had landed on the moon. So two vehicles land on the moon simultaneously. One has CCCP on it, the other one has USA. They touch down on the moon. A hatch opens, hatch opens. Cosmonaut comes out, astronaut comes out, and they walk over, touch the helmets together. Hello, Hans, hello, Fritz. Now we speak German. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good note on which to write. <laughs> Isn't that a cute story, though? And Werner made me tell it every day.